This year marks the 100th anniversary of the appearances of Our Lady in Fatima, Portugal. We'll talk about those events tonight and the meaning of a special prayer requested specifically by Our Lady at Fatima for Christ's saving intervention. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. My father, Mr. Paco, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. Before we get to our guests, I want to mention that today is the feast of two different saints from two different periods. One is St. Jerome Emiliani. After his own reconversion to the faith, he began to do a lot of work of caring for orphans. He was born in 1486 and lived only until 1537. This was a time when there was a lot of plague and a lot of orphans were around. And so he founded the Somashi Fathers, uh, a congregation of regular clerics, to take care of orphans and abandoned children. And he'd go into debt and be running away from his various uh, creditors. This reminds me of Mother Angelica. And as a result, uh, you know, he would still take care of the orphans. Well, the second saint is modern, uh, Saint Josephine Bajita. She was born in 1869 and lived until 1947. She, as a small girl, had been captured as a slave. Arabs from the north of Sudan frequently captured those who were black Africans as slaves. In fact, that still is going on uh, in Sudan. We see that in Darfur and otherwise has been part of the uh, history of the region of East Africa and West Africa. As a nine-year-old, she was kept in slavery and abused in various ways. But eventually, she was bought by an Italian who brought her to Italy. She didn't realize that it Italy had long before abolished slavery. And she was able to have her freedom against the will of her very secular owner. This man did not practice the Catholic faith. He was very secular and modern, but not so modern and respectful of individual freedom as to let her go as a slave and free her right away. She became a Catholic and eventually became a nun and grew in tremendous holiness urge you to go to our religious catalog to get that wonderful, wonderful video of her life. Uh, she's so inspiring, especially in our time, where there are more slaves in the world today than there were in the 1800s. The slavery today is primarily for, uh, not, not just forced labor, but also the, the sex trade. And She's the patron saint not only of Sudan, but also of people in slavery. Let's pray that that slave trade end and true freedom and dignity be restored. We have a guest tonight. He's a Catholic writer and a blogger who has been digging into the theological treasures of what's known as the Fatima Prayer. This is a brief, in English, 29-word prayer spoken by Our Lady to the children of Fatima. Despite its simplicity, it touches some of the great themes of Christianity, 
the reality of sin, the forgiveness God offers, the mercy that is available to us, but also the reality of heaven or hell for those who do or do not seek forgiveness and mercy. It brings up a number of interesting points for discussion, which we'll talk about tonight. Now, our guest is the co-author, along with Stephen Boulevant, of a new book coming out this spring, which is called, Oh My Jesus, The Meaning of the Fatima Prayer. Please welcome Mr. Luke Arredondo. Luke, welcome. Thank you, Father. Good to have you here. Great to be here. Good. Um, what are you up to these days? What are you doing these days? Uh, I'm, I'm blogging. Uh, sounds does not like much of a career choice. What what are you up to? <laughs> well, it hasn't become a career yet. No, uh, I'm I'm actually doing uh, full time PhD work uh, at Florida State. Okay. Uh, I'm in the religion department there and um, exploring a lot of questions of Catholic interest. Um, and so that the coursework right now is keeping me busy, along with blogging and raising three three daughters. And my wife, of course, helps me a lot with that. But um, oh, yeah. that keeps me busy most days. Good. Uh, <laughs> As you start learning uh, uh, various things in theology and such, uh, are your daughters learning along with you? Well, they know Daddy's always reading, right? Yes. Daddy always has some, some extra books he needs to be reading. He, yeah. he gets up early and does his homework. So they know which <laughs> books I read a lot. Um, and they're, uh, they're imitating some of my habits, right? They like having books. I don't know if they read them yet, but they at least like opening them and looking <laughs> at them. How old are they? My oldest is five, and she's starting to read a little bit. And then we have a, a three-year-old. So my oldest is Faustina. I have a three-year-old Kiara and a two-year-old Therese. Uh -huh. um, and they, they love being around books, so they, they've at least caught that much from me. Okay. <laughs> well, let's see how they eventually like the title. I, I suspect the, the, the younger ones are not all that interested in academic theology. Not yet, no, no. And I don't know that they even know what it is, but uh, they are learning their prayers very well, and I'm teaching them a lot of chants because they don't like to go to sleep, so I'll chant to them over and over and over till they fall asleep. I've learned all the verses of the um, O Filii et Filiae in Latin because that's one of their favorite chants. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. All right. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this program, we're about to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the apparitions at Fatima. A lot of our, the folks in our audience are not that familiar with it. Um, give, give a brief rundown sure. on what happened, uh, it'll be 100 years ago this coming May. Right. So uh, at the outset, what got started? Sure. There? Well, um, everyone looks to May 13th as sort of the first apparition, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what, what, in fact, is the case is that prior to that first apparition, which is always is marked as the, the big day, um, these children received different visitors over a period of a couple of years. So they received a, a mysterious visitor three years prior. So that would have put them at the ages of seven, four, and six. Uh, and they went home and told their mothers and their family about it right away. And they were ridiculed by their family, by their friends. Everyone thought they were lying. Sounded too, too made up, a woman of light, this mysterious sign. Um, so, so a little time goes by, and uh, in 1912, they receive another visitor. It's an angel who comes to them three times, and he asks them to pray, much like the, the messages that they receive in the apparitions, because of God being offended by sin. Uh, they're, they're offered a miraculous form of Holy Communion. Um, and they're told to, to pray and to offer sacrifices for sinners. And for that year, they don't tell anybody about it. They keep it secret. And then on May 13th, they receive this more extraordinary apparition of who turns out to be Mary. Uh, and that was what year? That's 1917. 1917. Sorry. So 1916 was the angel. Yes, I yeah, I was going to say, not 1912. Yeah. Right, I didn't yeah. think so. But, and again, it's good to know that uh, the world was in tremendous suffering. Right. Uh, World War I had been underway since 1914. And Portugal experienced a revolution that was very anti-church, anti-Catholic. Sure. It was a very secular uh, revolution that took place there. And also modernity was already beginning to sever its links with traditional Christian morality, 
that was the basis of European culture. Sure. So these are some of the background elements. So then on May 13th, 1917, again, with still a year and a half of war to go. Sure. Um, what were some of the things that were being said? Well, Mary asked the children, not only themselves, to offer prayers and sacrifice for, for sinners, but to tell other people to do so as well. Um, she also would, in the course of the apparitions, which she appeared six times on the 13th of every month, uh, ask them to pray the Fatima prayer, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, to pray the rosary, and then at different times she says to pray the rosary frequently, to pray it daily, uh, and to offer the first Saturday's devotion, and for the, the church to be, and the world to be, or Russia rather, to be consecrated to her, to her Immaculate Heart and to Jesus' Sacred Heart. And, and again, an, uh, good to understand that at this time, Russia was not yet communist. Right, yes. This would, this would have headed off a lot of the, she, she says that there are a lot of errors that Russia is going to spread into the world if this consecration and these prayers and these instructions are not followed. A worse war will follow soon after this one. Mm -hmm. So there's still hope in the, in the, at the outset of the apparitions that maybe the war that's going on can be stopped and that can be the end of it. But there's a very clear warning. If these things don't happen, if my instructions aren't followed, Russia's errors are going to be spread and magnified um, and a greater war will come. And of course it did. And Russia's errors, you know, still are around in, in some form. Right. My um, step-grandfather had left Russia in 1914, just a f uh, oh, about six, seven months before the war began. He would not knowing there was going to be war. Nobody sure. knew right. uh, when he left that there would be war, but he just knew that uh, bad opportunities. But by the time of the apparitions, the Tsar's government is becoming shaky. The war went very badly for the Russian army. And I think it was what, in the following July? that the Menshevik Revolution took place? Yeah, I'm not sure of the exact I, timeline, I think but it was, it's, it's I right think it was in that time frame. July, and then by October, just a couple weeks after the last apparition, right. was the Bolshevik yeah. Revolution that brought communism to the, uh, made the government atheistic communistic government, uh, beginning a period of horrendous, uh, the catastrophes for Russia right. and widespread death and martyrdom of Christians. Yeah, and martyrdom of a culture too, right? When you, when you spread um, a, an ideology that's this atheistic and at, at its core, um, any sort of morality that says this is in fact right, this is in fact wrong, and that's how it has to be, begins to be eroded away. And when you kill all the people that are believing in that, right, you, you raise a culture that doesn't recognize any right. sort of a moral law. It becomes very difficult to to rehabilitate that. And so folks can understand, in the, the time from 1917 through 1990, the Soviet government executed or starved or worked to death 61.9 million of their own citizens, in wow. addition to those who died in, in battles sure. or wars. So it was, yeah. it was catastrophic. Absolutely. As and atheism always is. <laughs> and you, you wonder too, it's, it's, you, when you read the, you know, Lucia's own words of the apparitions and the clear warning, you know, you wonder what, what more could it take, right? To, here's a clear warning, do these things so that worse things don't follow and yet the worse things follow. But it doesn't end as, as being a game over, right? There's an opportunity for mercy and for redemption and, and God can still work, work things out to be uh, he can he could straighten things out, but it's it's a little frustrating to look at. Here's all these warnings. Why didn't people follow it? Um, right. But you see, you know, I mean, you see that even in the Gospels, right? Lazarus says, "Send someone who's risen from the dead." You know, send Abraham to my family. The rich and guy. The not, rich guy, rather, right? Yeah, yeah, right. He's, he's uh, send them, and you know, Abraham, if he comes from the dead, then my family will believe. And so, no, even right. if they see someone who rises from the dead, they won't right. believe if they haven't believed already. And I, I again, I think too. Um, when people looked at Russia in that part of 1917, except for the Ottoman Empire, Russia was the most backward country in Europe. It was the least industrialized, least amount of education. It had the longest uh, use of serfs. The uh, serfs have been freed just less than about 50 years earlier. So people would never think 
that error would spread from Russia to Eastern Europe, China, North Korea, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Laos. Nobody ever dreamed right. that communism would spread to Cuba and other, other states with the oppressiveness as well. Yeah. yeah it's but hard. it happened. Sure. Our, our <laughs> lady was right. Yes. The political analysts had not a clue. Right. Not a clue. Yeah. So this is important to keep in mind. Now, along with that message about Russia, there was also, as you already mentioned too, the strong message about the need for moral reform throughout the world, including the West. Sure. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, she, that, that Mary is so concerned with in these apparitions is uh, a return to a spiritual life, right? A return to faithfulness to the Eucharist, um, to, to not only to receiving it, but receiving it worthily, um, to prayer, uh, especially the prayer of the rosary. Uh, in, in fact, she says, uh, Lucia asks at, at the, the request of uh, Francisco and, and Jacinta, you know, who's going to go to heaven? Are, are we going to go to heaven? Am I going to make it? And she says, yes, you know, uh, Jacinta will go to heaven soon. Francis, Frances, Francesco, Francisco also will go to heaven, but he will have to pray many rosaries. Uh, so even in that context, you know, she sees that uh, prayer is a really critical thing, and she offers the rosary time and time again throughout these apparitions as a basic way to get that prayer life going, mm -hmm. um, and as a sort of a necessary tool in the spiritual life. Uh, and then in addition to the, the first Saturday devotions, uh, and that's all ordered not to, to its own end, right? It's not that like prayer, just, just by saying a prayer, everything is magically fixed. But in order to keep praying, most people will at least slow down the rate at which they're sinning, right? You, you, you don't hear many people that pray the rosary every single day, but still go on sinning, right? Yeah. Usually do one or the other. You'll quit, you'll quit sinning or you'll quit saying the rosary. Um, so she, she offers us some, some really profound truths there and also a frightening vision of what happens if if these instructions aren't followed, not just for the world, but for souls. The Archbishop Sheen had a wonderful line about this. He said that one of the basic choices is that either we will learn to act in accord with, with the way we, we believe, believe right. or we will end up believing the way in, which in accord we the w with the way we act. Yeah. So people who prefer sin will reduce their faith down to the level of the sins they like. Whereas people who put prayer as the priority will allow God's grace to transform them in accord with what he teaches them in the faith. Yes. This is a basic decision that we have to make yes. about prayer. And one of my favorite lines from Fulton Sheen too, I love that line. Um, the, and he's, he gives us a, you know, a witness to what that fidelity looks like, um, e even in the face of people who wouldn't believe that there are real problems. Uh, and he was certainly concerned with Russia for so many years. Yes. Um, and he knew, he saw, he saw the dangers and, and tried to encourage people to pray and fast. And um, he, he turned out to be right in a lot of ways with regard to what, what was going to happen there also. Well, he, he was well aware of much of the uh, vicious persecution going on. A lot of folks today, especially young people, are not taught about the atrocities sure. that were done by the Russians. I mean, the National Socialists in Germany, the Nazis, were evil enough. Right. But what, hit, what, what Stalin and Lenin did was far, far exceeded the amount of death by six times. Yeah. Under Hitler, 10 million people died in concentration camps. Whereas with Stalin, it was, again, 61.9 million. Yeah. According to the KGB. Right. So that's this, a tremendous number. It, it is. So, so Sheen was well aware, and that was one of his key messages in his shows, you know, to pray to stop Russia's errors. But he also always believed the message of Fatima. Sure. That Russia would turn around and come back right. to being a faithful country. Yes. Tell about that part of the messages. Yes. Yeah, so um, in, in the messages, there's this tremendous hope, right, of, of mercy being able to conquer the evil that's, that's happening. 
Um, and it, one of the things that, that I find really fascinating is the relationship between the Fatima message, which on its, on its face and often when you hear people talking about it, it sounds much more dour, more, much more like things are just bad. Um, but the relationship between Fatima and the divine mercy apparitions, right? So some time goes by, things aren't going well, and you, know, you get to the, the 30s, things are about to turn even worse. And at that time, Jesus reveals himself in this special way, this special message of mercy to an, an otherwise unknown sister, right? Faustino lived an almost entirely invisible life. Uh, she went to school for three years, um, tried to enter an order earlier in her life. Her parents didn't want her to. Everyone that knew her in the order thought, here's a sister who just does menial tasks, right? right. But she's, being, she's receiving this, this tremendous message of mercy. What I see in Fatima is the, the basic idea of mercy as a possibility or that we should hope and pray for, the salvation of everyone, right? That they, all, all sinners may go to heaven. Um, and then in the divine mercy, it becomes the necessity because we didn't avert the great danger. Um, now Jesus is still going to be faithful to that message in an even more profound way through, through the divine mercy. Well, see, this is something that uh, uh, about the divine mercy that message of mercy is also part of the message to pray at Fatima. Sure, yeah. Let me just quote the prayer right? Uh, so folks can hear what we're talking about because, frankly, when I was growing up, the uh, Fatima prayer was not taught to us. That was something that I learned as an adult. Me too. Uh, you know, it just we didn't, wasn't part of what was going on but uh, back in the 50s. But here's the prayer. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell and lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Amen. Now, this prayer is fairly simple. It is. Fairly straightforward. Um, but you've been able to study this and find that there's a lot of implications to, so we don't just say it, but sure. we should enter more deeply into Absolutely. that prayer and the meaning of it. Where would you begin your reflection on that prayer? Well, before even looking at the prayer itself, I mean, think of other prayers that we have in our tradition, right? The Hail Mary, the Our Father. Um, those are prayers upon which the saints have pondered at length, right, and written at length. Thomas Aquinas, for instance, in his catechism has a great treatment of the Our Father. Um, and more recently, right, Benedict XVI in his uh, Jesus of Nazareth, Volume 1, enters into a great exposition of the Our Father. It's, it's a huge section of the catechism's treatment of prayer. So we do this always. All of the, the, the great prayers of our tradition, we, the, we are taught to look at them carefully and yes. draw out all the flavor that's in them. Yes, St. Cyprian had done his treatise on the Lord's Prayer sure. back in the 3rd century. So yeah. this is so an important part of the church to delve into the meaning yes. of the words of prayers. And so even, I mean, right from the opening line, right, Oh, my Jesus, that is, that is a tremendously powerful statement indicative of Jesus somehow being mine, right, of an intimacy that is appropriate for the children to whom it was revealed. Yeah. Children are, are not shy about calling someone their daddy or my daddy, you know. Right. There's a possession there. Um, my daughters, uh, still, depending on their mood, will cling to me like, you know, if, if we're going to be <laughs> separated for 10 minutes, like, oh, the world's ending. No, 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 you know. Um, and so these children receive this message, oh, my Jesus. Um, in Scripture, people don't speak to Jesus that, that comfortably, right? They'll call him son of David, master, Lord. They, 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 they use a title. But here it's just a simple, childlike, oh, my Jesus, right? This, this is such an intimate way of addressing our Lord. And yet it's the way that Mary, of course she would say that, right? Yeah. She's, she's the mother of yeah. Jesus. So of course she uses that language, but she wants us to use it too. And not just those children. And, and that relates to the words of our Lord in say Matthew 19 and such uh, and the parallels where he, when the apostles want little kids go away. Sure. It's no, no, no. For such belong the kingdom of heaven. 
let the little children come to me, that he enjoys that childlike possessiveness. Absolutely. Not because it's controlling. No, right, because the great faith that it requires exactly. to place yourself in that sort of, the vulnerability and the humility it requires. It's really interesting, too, to consider, you know, this is 1917, Therese of Lace, who's still alive, um, or, uh, and she's developing the little way, right? And that is just absolutely in tune with this notion of, oh, my Jesus, yeah. um, to pray that. Well, she wasn't intimately. alive. She, she, well, did been, she, she, died did she die in the 1890s. 1890s. Yeah, so okay. she's she 20 years, I think, right. 1897. So I always know she died at the age of 24, right. and I uh, tend to think that it's 1924 whenever no, I think no, of it no, in my no, mind. No, no, no. She, so, um, but it's, it's absolutely in line with her view, her spirituality, right, right. Um, of placing yourselves in Jesus' hands. Like she wants to be a, a plaything in Jesus' hands so that he can do whatever is appropriate, whatever he wants. And he can leave her on the floor, and that's okay, right? This, she's, she wants to be his. Um, and so, I mean, the opening line, I, I think, is a powerful line because it's something that a child could, could easily pray, right? But that adults, well, it takes us a little bit more work to enter into that sort of childlike intimacy with with Jesus but it's a childlike intimacy that he desires from absolutely us. He, he you know and his mother is there to teach us to have that kind of yes you know intimacy with, with, with him yeah and it's it I mean one of the things about the prayer itself too is that she asks she's asking people to pray the rosary all the time in the apparitions and, and in, in other apparitions it's clearly something she wants us to do but she says not only to pray this prayer but to pray it at the end of each decade, yes. right? Um, which, in, and when I was growing up and I learned to pray the rosary, I didn't learn the Fatima prayer. I was in college and I heard some people mutter it quickly and I wondered, what, what was that? Did I, did I miss something? I thought I, I thought I knew how this rosary thing worked. Um, but to add it into that special prayer is a really significant suggestion, yeah. right? Yeah, well, it, it, I know I, I first heard it while I was saying the rosary uh, at, at a funeral uh, you know, and in, uh, as a priest, I uh, just never heard it. I mean, the Franciscan sisters that taught me apparently didn't know it or didn't pass it on. Right. So, uh, but it, it, it's something that now everybody just includes in uh, at the end of each decade of the rosary. Yeah. That we want to begin with that focus on Jesus. And that's, I, th I think that's important too. Sure. That the addition helps to make the rosary even more centered on Jesus. Right. Yeah, John Paul II said that uh, in, in the prayer of the rosary, I mean, the, the Hail Mary is the prayer we say the, the greatest number of times, and the word Jesus is the center of gravity of the Hail Mary. So yeah. you can rest on it, lean on it a little bit. Right. Uh, if you have little kids and that the only word they can pronounce is Jesus, that's easy because it'll take them five or six seconds to realize it's their turn. And then they say the one word, Jesus. <laughs> and then you continue on with the prayer, right? And uh, so the, the, the Fatima prayer is another opportunity for us to sort of just put our weight, uh, put our emphasis on that. And I really like that image that John Paul II uses of the, the center of gravity of the prayer, right? The, the, the rosary is fundamentally a Christological, a Christocentric prayer. And it, it's, it's something to also keep in mind that it was a Franciscan who added the name Jesus. Did you know oh, that? Oh, wow. No, I didn't. Yeah, it was St. Bernardine of Siena, who had a tremendous devotion to the name of, holy name of Jesus sure. and spread that. And with permission of the Pope, they added that to the Hail oh, Mary. Oh, wow. Because it was just, blessed is the fruit of your womb, womb, which is what the Scripture sure, says. Sure, right. He added Jesus. So. Oh, but wow. What we have to do is take a little break. Okay. And we're going to be back in a bit. If you want to learn more about the apparitions at Fatima, you can get information on special EWTN programming for the anniversary of Fatima by going to our website, EWTN.com slash Fatima. And we'll be back in just about two minutes, so please stay with us.
Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. First of all, I want to invite you to come join us. You can make a pilgrimage here to EWTN. We encourage you to contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. Or you can go to the website, EWTN.com. <coughs> They'll give you all sorts of information about the scheduling of, program, of programs where you can be in the audience, mass schedules, tours, you know, directions to um, Hansful to go pray with the sisters. So we'd love to have you. And of course, as the, this month and the next uh, couple months go along, it's the beginning of springtime down here, so we urge you to be with us. Also, you can pre-order your copy of the, the book, Oh My Jesus, The F Meaning of the Fatima Prayer by Stephen Boulevant and tonight's guest, Luke Arredondo. You can get it from EWTN's religious catalog, EWTNRC.com, or you can call them, 1-800-854-6300. Six. Well, Luke, let's get back to business here. We we're sure. talking about the, the Fatima prayer right. that we include at the end of each decade of the rosary. And we began with the first part, oh my Jesus. You know, but that's just the address to the Lord. Right. Go on. What, what so, else yeah, the do first, you have there? The first petition, if you wanna if you wanna call it that, right, is to forgive us our sins. Right? Oh my Jesus. Forgive us our sins. And when thinking about that, that line, it implicates the prayer, right? It's forgive us our sins. So it's not something you... No, you don't mean the words of the prayer, but the person who is praying. The person who is praying, yes. right? It in, so if I speak, forgive us our sins, I include myself in the us. I'm not merely praying for those people out there who are That's sinning, right. right? For all those, those people who are causing scandal or whatever. I'm praying for myself. Very much like the, the uh, second part of the Hail Mary. Right. Um, pray for uh, us pray, pray for sinners. us sinners. Yes. And I think... By the way, you know who added that? Um, no, I don't. St. Peter Canisius. Wow. That was added, you know, in the 16th century. Sure. So the, the, and I bring that up because the Hail Mary itself grew and developed. Yes. You know, from the initial two lines of scripture right. to the prayer that it is today. But yeah, St. Peter Canisius added, you know, that part, Holy Mary, Mother God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Yes. And so that's one of the things that, that you know, we highlight in, in the book is this relationship between that notion of communal sin, right? Um, personal sin that also impacts others uh, so that no one's exempt from it. This isn't merely, the, you know, the prayer of the Pharisee, Right. Oh, oh, those terrible sinners. I'm so glad I'm not them. Uh, we're more more like in the mode of the tax collector. Right. Uh, yes. Implicating ourselves, striking our own breasts um, and accepting that we have, in fact, sinned, which right. in 1917, Mary said was important. And certainly it was. But it's hard to think in 100 years since then that people have grown in an awareness right, of the fact that we, we aren't perfect. Uh, yeah. every, everybody talks today about how they're OK and everything's OK. Um, so I, it's a sort of a radical claim now, maybe more so than it was in you know, 100 years ago, to recognize our own sin. I, I think this also relates to the errors of Russia. Oh, because sure. Because the Karl Marx believed that if you just got rid of the church and belief in God. Right. He called religion the opiate of the people and turned over the means of production to the workers sure. with guidance by the state, if not control, <laughs> then you would have a worker's paradise. And that's what he promised, as if all the workers and all the peoples in the state would be without sin. That's the underlying assumption. Sure. The church makes you sin, but get rid of the church, and then we'll all be without sin in a perfect society. Right. And his worker's paradise became a worker's hell on earth. Absolutely. You know, so th that's, I, th I think, an important part 
of that prayer. Yeah, and it's one of the things, too, that, you know, we, we spoke about Fulton Sheen earlier. Um, he, he saw in his time the rise of modern psychology, right, which, which wanted to tell people that, you know, fundamentally you are uh, not guilty, right? That's not the root of who you are. Right. It's something you need to kind of distance yourself from. Um, you know, and he, it's your parents' fault. He, it's it's somebody's fault. It's it's some system. Depending on who the who the thinker is, there's a different explanation for it. But but it's not you, right? Right. Um, and you know, within the church, I mean, we're we're not meant to be neurotic about our own guilt. It's not something that's supposed to consume us all the time. But we can't pretend that we have no sin, right? That's that's a very big problem. Um, and this this simple prayer, if we're attentive to the words, it helps remind us of that reality. Um, and that's why St. Paul distinguishes in, I believe it's 2 Corinthians 7, between actual guilt that we must admit to sure. versus an emotional guilt that is not healthy for us. Yeah. Just feeling emotion about our guilt is not going to help right. us spiritually. Absolutely. But understanding what I am responsible for having done and the things that were wrong about what I chose to do wrong. Yes. That's actual guilt. Yes. So we, we go from, oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, right? And then the next line, save us from the fires of hell. Oh, scary kids. Right. Uh, Stephen says in the book, we, we wrote different parts of it, but it, this is one of my favorite lines that, that he had written. It says, hell's not as popular as it used to be anymore. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, no one wants to talk about it. Um, but at the same time, Pope Francis, who's immensely popular, talks about it constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the main themes of his daily homilies is the reality of sin, the reality of the devil, the reality of hell. These are themes that he holds at the same time as he talks about mercy so much. So uh, I think one, one of the things you can draw from this prayer is the, the healthy balance between keeping an awareness of the reality of sin, right? Uh, forgive us our sins, the possibility of hell, but also the possibility and opportunity for mercy. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you shut one or the other of those out, things don't work. No, well, why would you need mercy? If nobody goes to hell, <laughs> you know, if it's ollie, ollie, oxen, free, free, <laughs> right. free, sure. there's no need to ask for mercy. Yes. And when we're not aware of, I find this in my own life, and when I'm not reminding myself and taking ownership of, of the fact that I am a sinner, I'm not as inclined to give mercy to other people. And this is one of the, uh, one of the really powerful things to me about this prayer and about the, the, the past year's Jubilee of Mercy, right, is that recognizing our own need for mercy helps so much to give mercy to others in those moments where we might otherwise lose our temper or blame them for something. Right. We can pause for a second and think, what would I really deserve if all of my sins were well known? Uh, boy, maybe I should take it easy on this person, you know, in whatever that moment is. For me, a lot of times it's with my kids. Yeah. Um, take it easy on them, you know, um, yeah. because mercy is something that we all need and we can give it to everyone. But you know, it, it also brings out another element that people tend to ignore, namely that our bad behavior is truly bad, sure. not just because God extrinsically says, oh, I don't like it. It has a disorder inside our behavior. There's a disordered quality that messes not only our own lives, but messes up the lives of a lot of other people. Yes. And this is an element that often gets forgotten. And therefore, our sins have consequences. Yeah. And if we keep living our sins, there's a hellish quality, like I mentioned with the Marxists. Right. They created a hell on earth and people suffered. Absolutely. I think that's an important thing that, and I always like the quote of St. Catherine of Siena, that it's heaven all the way to heaven. <laughs> but C.S. Lewis brought out the converse. Right. It's hell all the way to hell. Sure. For those who are damned, they already experienced the hellishness of life. Right. And that tension between what 
what they're doing and what they ought to be doing, you know. And even when you try and erase the names and the categories of sin, it's still it's still an experience, right? It's, it's still a reality you can't get away from, which is exactly. why precisely there were so many problems in Russia or in any place where you try and stamp out religion altogether. It, it never works. Uh, people aren't perfect, unfortunately. Right? It's not like Socrates said, you know, if you just know, then you won't do what's wrong. If you, if you, we, we know and we still do. And right. there's where the problem right. is. And there's another factor, too, in our culture. I think that is important to that, that what you're saying here brings out. It's politically incorrect to bring out the consequences of sin. Sure. So people who are having children outside of wedlock, you don't say, oh, well, that's just their choice. So you can't impose your religion on them. Right. But what happens is that they impose the effects of that on the women. Usually it's the men leaving the, the sure. women. Not always. Right. And uh, that you impose on the whichever parent is left, these children, poverty, and uh, a whole series of problems sure. falls from it. It's not without consequences. Absolutely. Yeah, so. yeah, I mean, any sin, right, any personal sin has at least the implication, the possibility of social effects, right, on exactly. other people. Exactly. Um, so we have, you know, oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell. Uh, the image that is revealed to the children um, and in the oh, first yeah. apparition yeah. of hell um, is really just a harrowing account. And I mean, it's not anything uh, that sounds like anywhere you want to be, right? It's, there's fire and there's people in torment. I mean, Lucia gives a very brief description of it in the, in the official uh, memoirs but it's terrifying and it's really fascinating to me and I know Stephen found it interesting as well that right after that apparition right after they see this vision is when the words of the prayer are revealed so here they see hell and right after that say this prayer oh my Jesus forgive us our sins save us from the fires of hell and lead all souls to heaven instead right now, the one, one of the things, before we get to that, you know, you're a father, and there are, when you're dealing with very small children, the ways to motivate them to behave include fear of punishment as Absolutely. well as promise of reward. Sure. Does fear of punishment have a good effect or a bad effect on them? It depends, I think, on, on the, the mood and the particular context, but there are some things that we, we, don't, we don't want to imagine the alternative, right? Uh, for instance, you know, not walking away with a stranger. Right? I, I want my children to be terrified of that reality so that we never find out what happens if, that, if they go through that, right? Well, I mean, that's not something I want them to learn by experience. Well, I'll let them do it their own way and see how it works out. Um, you yeah, know. playing in the street. Yeah, that's, you know, and they want to play in the out. street, right? Yeah. But I have to try and scare them away from that. Um, and you see, I mean, there's there's the divine pedagogy that that, that is, I mean, God's fatherhood is, is so, so such a good model for an earthly father to see how he deals with Israel, right? Um, through oftentimes terrifying experiences. And then by the time we get to the new covenant, the community is a little bit more mature. Revelation is going to change. Um, so this this notion of the threat of the fires of hell has its place, um, and it never totally goes away. But it's more it's it's certainly more appropriate for a sort of a younger um, you know age. Right, and and it's it's something that uh, you know even as an adult, I don't play in the street. <laughs> sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just know better on yes. my own to absolutely. not to do that. But you know my. You know, we lived in the city and playing ball in the street was the most obvious wide space to play ball. Sure. You know, <laughs> yes. so, um, you know, this was something that, you know, uh, it was important to learn. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, we, we go from, right, save us from the fires of hell immediately into lead all souls to heaven, right? Save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven. Um, that tremendous hope 
um, that's there, that the possibility that we could pray for all people, that, that maybe their salvation is possible. Um, and you think in the context of, you know, 1917, right before Russia went off the brink, um, we could still pray for those people, that it may be possible in some way for them to go to heaven. Right. Um, but also for ourselves, right? That this is, this is the reality. We're praying for us, right? Yeah. Forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven. So there's a tremendous hope and mercy present, even in this context in which Mary is saying things aren't looking very good for the future. There's, a, there's trouble coming. There's a war coming. But still pray you know, that all souls may go to heaven. Um, and that's, that's a tremendously important thing to remember in our contemporary context, too. And, and we see in uh, St. Paul's letter to Timothy, chapter 2, verse 4, God wills all men to be saved. Right. That should be our desire. We want everybody to be saved yes. as, much, as much as God wants them to be saved. His desire is something we want to make our desire. Yes, absolutely. Um, and in that way, I mean, there's a, there's a the close relationship, in, you know, to the Our Father, right? Uh, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Right. You know, there's a similar principle at work in this prayer. Um, one of the things I thought about this prayer, I mean, it's so short, uh, is that maybe it's, a, it's, it's an easier sort of catechism for these, these young, uh, you know, shepherds to, to remember just these basic words. As, as you said in the introduction, it, it contains all of these major themes of our faith, mm -hmm. and it's right there. Um, and at the same time, it's one of, the, one of the prayers that, if it's even said in, when people are praying the rosary, can be just blown through really quickly. And that's, that's such a great temptation for us all when we're praying sure. anything, especially sure. but a spoken prayer, to, to slow down a little bit and try and really think about what we're saying. Um, and this is the sort of a summary of, of what you've said in, in the previous prayers, you know, by the time you get to the end of a decade. Yeah. Now, the last part of the prayer is, you know, to have mercy, especially on those most, most need in need of, of your mercy. mercy. Right. Um, though this is another uh, important element to pray for those most in need of your mercy. Right. What were some of your reflections on that prayer? Well, uh, it's it's counterintuitive, right? Who's most in need of God's mercy? Certainly, I'm very much in need of God's mercy. I think we all are, but those most in need have the least idea. Right, they're they're the most convinced of their own self sufficiency. Um, they think they don't need it, and precisely because they think they don't, means they're in the most critical situation. Whereas on the opposite end of the spectrum, right, a saint is the most keenly aware of their need for mercy. Good. Right, you know, you read um, story of a soul or any any diary that a saint has left. I remember the first time I read. The story of a soul. I was in the seminary at the time, and it was some assigned reading, and I knew Therese was a doctor of the church and a saint and everything. And I, I read it, and it it didn't make sense to me right away. It was like she seems awfully down on herself. You know, she's uh -huh. I mean, this is a woman that never committed a mortal sin. Why is she so hard on herself? Uh, but it was because she was aware that the goodness that was in her was something given freely, and not something earned. Um, and that's by the same token, you know, you remember everyone talks about John Paul II. He, he went to confession every week. You know, when the first time I heard that, that made zero sense to me. Why would he go to confession every week? He's like the Pope. He's a really good guy. He'll probably be a saint someday. That's why he'll be a saint someday, right? Because he was aware of that. So part of this, this prayer, who, the, who are those in most need of thy mercy? They're the ones that need to hear this the most. They're the ones that, that don't even know that they need mercy. And so in that context... This, the, the way the church has focused on mercy so much, uh, especially since John Paul II's time, right, raising up Faustina to the altars and spreading a divine mercy feast to the whole church, Francis's jubilee. I mean, this is mission critical time for telling people about the goodness of mercy, certainly, but also that we need it. And so it points us back to the first part of the prayer. I, I oftentimes use an experience that a lot of us men have. Uh, unless you wear cowboy boots like I do, if you get dressed in the morning, put on your socks, you know, and then you go outside in the sunshine 
and you realize one is dark blue and the other is <laughs> black. Right. But you can't tell in the darkness of the room like you can Absolutely. in the sunlight. Yeah. And uh, I, I've done that with pants. I thought I was buying black pants that ended up being <laughs> navy blue, but I couldn't see it until I got outside. Yeah. And it brings out how the closer we get to God, the more we understand our sinfulness. The farther away we are from God, the less we can detect our sinfulness. He's the sunlight that shows where the specks are on the glass and where the, the stains are in the dark clothes. And this is, he's the one who shines more brightly on us. And the closer we are, the more we realize our sinfulness. While the people who are totally caught up in a world of sin and assumptions of sin, I'm, I'm a good person. Right. I haven't killed anybody. Sure. And that's always the measure, right? If I haven't killed anybody, I must be a pretty good person. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um. <laughs> the Al Capone moral system. Right. <laughs> I, uh, I used a, a similar image when I was uh, working at a parish and did religious ed interviews for First Communion. For whatever reason, the window in my office had a terrible mold stain on it. And I would point to it and say, can you see any fingerprints on that window? On the inside of the window, can you see the fingerprints? No, because there's mold all over the outside of it. Well, my daughters had made fingerprints all over it when they were there. You couldn't see them because the light couldn't shine through it. Now, you know, I would use that to explain yeah. to the kids. Um, and the the thing that's tricky about it, those 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 are who are in most need of, of God's mercy. They don't know. I mean, how right. do we tell them? You know, right. how how do you convince them? Is it is it going to be with the threat of the fires of hell? Is that what's going to do it for them? Maybe, might not do it though. So it, that's a tricky situation to to be aware of how serious an issue this is, right? Because mm -hmm. we have this terrible punishment that could await us, even if we know that we need mercy and we just don't do what we're supposed to. Right. Um, so how the, the method of getting people to a place where they're aware of the mercy that they need is a tricky one, you know? And I think yeah. Francis is, is making some strides to try and, and, and help people. And it's not that he's not the first person to do this, but right. certainly something that's very high on his priority list. Um, and I think a lot of it ha for, on, for the lay typical lay Catholic, right, is to, to be an example of mercy to others. Extend it to them, you know, constantly. Uh, and then perhaps this can work as a sort of pedagogical motivation, you know. And I think, too, to, to humbly admit oneself sure. that my sins have had these bad effects on me and on the people around me. And that sometimes helps people to not be so defensive about their sins. Um, on some of these television talk shows that are not on this network, <laughs> you'll have people throwing things at each other and trying to beat each other. It's not my fault, and that they'll be yelling and screaming. But when somebody makes themselves more vulnerable in admitting their faults and sinfulness, that sometimes can lower the, the tone a little bit right. among other people so that they can realize maybe I am one of the people most in need of mercy. Right. And you so, think of, you know, Francis's election, one of the first things he says is pray for me. Right. right? right. Um, exactly. And, and his, his exactly. big interview. And uh, that, that won a lot of hearts. I want to tell people uh, again to sure. pre-order your book. Uh, it's called, Oh My Jesus, The Meaning of of the Fatima Prayer. The authors are Stephen Boulevant and tonight's guest, Luke Arredondo. You can get it at EWTN's Religious Catalog, either online, EWTNRC.com, or you can call 1-800-854-6316. Hope you get that and helps your prayer. We've run slap out of time. All right. I appreciate you being here with us. Well, thanks for having me. And sharing some of your reflections on this. And I want to offer you all a blessing. Almighty God bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, and lead you in all of his ways by his peace, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
and we urge you to remember that Mother Angelica set up this network so that it's brought to you by you. So we ask that you please keep us in between your gas bill and your electric bill and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. Thank you, and God bless.